Okay, so this is the review of uh, Regents Questions. We're going to use the June 2017 uh, questions. So this is a, a year ago from the time this recording is being made. So we start right away. We'll do the um, multiple choice first. Okay, and as usual, the Regents exam begins with um, multiple choice questions about uh, geography. They're somehow geography based. Question one, which geographic feature most influenced the development of large plantations in the southeastern region of the United States? So as we remember, there were um, three areas. What were they? They were the Northeast, or Northern Colonies. That's New England, primarily. And what is that? They are rocky soil. Uh, not terribly fertile. Long winters, we should say. Good for fishing. But not great for crops. So, small family farms and villages. And tended to be completely English. That is settlers of English background, right? Second was middle colonies. That's New York, Pennsylvania, that area. This was fertile soil. Good for grain and things like this. Also good ports. The thing to remember about the middle colonies were they were the most diverse. You had English. Oops. You had English, but you also had who? Dutch. You had German. You had Swedes. Just to name a few. Oh, I can move this down a bit here. Um, so it te they tended to produce the kinds of food crops, grain crops, uh, for export, often for export, or for movement within the colonies. And then the third um, area of the colonies was, of course the southern colonies, that's Virginia, the Carolinas, and like that, what's to know, English, so they were not terribly diverse, slavery was important, you had slavery in all the colonies, but it was the biggest in Virginia and the Carolinas. They were about cash crops. Those are crops you grow to export for sale, as opposed to, say, crops in New England that were for, you know, your family to eat or to sell maybe in a local village or town. And what were the crops? Big, big tobacco, rice, indigo, which remembers that plant that's used for that blue dye. Uh, very valuable, um, mostly down by the Carolinas. Uh, why? Because the land was uh, low lands, also called bottom lands. Because it was at the bottom of those hills where um, the Appalachian Mountains would uh, 
you know, you get the runoff from erosion, which was pretty good fertile soil. <coughs> the best was the tidewater lands. That was the land that was closest to the ocean, tidal waters where you're getting the tides. Um, the closer you were to the ocean, the easier it was to export stuff, and it also tended to be the most fertile land, not because it was near the ocean, but because that was where the best soil happened to be. So those lowlands, cash crops, southern colonies, and therefore the southern colonies were what? All about big plantations, few villages and towns. Unlike New England, which was a network of small villages and towns, southern colonies tended to be a few big plantations owned by big wealthy landowners. Okay, so that gets us back then to the question. What geographic feature most influenced development of large plantations in the southeastern region of the U.S.? And the correct answer there would have to be the fertile lowlands. The first question on geography will often be about this. You should know all three of those colonial regions. The other things you should always make sure you remember are the major feature that stopped um, colonial uh, are the Appalachian Mountains. The western edge of the colonies were the Appalachian Mountains. The Louisiana Purchase, if it comes up in a geography question in the first couple of questions, was about control of the Mississippi River. And they sometimes ask, about colonists settling near what harbors and rivers because obviously the point of the colonies was to be able to export stuff you need to get people and goods to and from so having the harbor there or having a river they could use as a highway was always important okay question two what was an important goal of european mercantilism during the 1600s and 1700s correct answer there is increasing the mother country's wealth. Always know, mercantilism is that system of setting up colonies. The point of the colonies was they would feed raw materials to the mother country. The mother country could sell back those, the manufactured goods to the colonies, and so all the money wound up staying with the mother country. They did not want the colonies to be self-sufficient. Self-sufficient colonies meant independent colonies. They did not want colonies manufacturing their own stuff. Textiles, remember textiles is cloth and that sort of thing. They did not want them manufacturing their own stuff because they wanted the colonies buying stuff from the mother country. The colonies made it themselves. The money stayed in the colony. Improving trade between European nations, also wrong. Mercantilism was mother country with its own set of colonies feeding it. The last thing they wanted were those colonies trading with any other country. Okay. Which precedent was set as a result of the John Peter Zenger case? Precedent, of course, is uh, that which comes before precedes. So it sets the pattern, it sets the rule for what comes after it. When you see the John Peter Zenger case, you should think freedom of the press. Important. 1735, notice it's way before the American Revolution. John Peter Zenger, we remember, was a printer in New York City. He printed a newspaper that was critical of the um, governor, the English governor of the colony of New York. The governor had him arrested for printing, you know, nasty things about the government. And the jury found, this is under English rights and Englishman law, that there was a right to free press. The newspaper could print its opinions, including criticisms of the government. Much later on, when the United States of America comes along and is created, 
one of the first things we do was make sure we write into the Bill of Rights, the first ten amendments of the Constitution, protection for freedom of the press. So, see John Peter Zenger, think freedom of the press. Okay, let's look at question four. Move this up. Oops. Question, which heading best completes the partial outline below? Um, they like these partial outline questions. They give you a bunch of things, and then you have to pick what's the topic. So you're looking for what, what do they all have to do with? Brought to colonies against their will. Well, who were brought to the colonies against their will? Slaves. Okay. Endured brutal conditions. Okay. Well, it's also slaves. Provided labor for a successful agricultural economy. Remember, the slaves were brought to work, particularly those tobacco fields to start with, and eventually cotton. Resisted attempts to eliminate their culture. If you remember, we talked about that the slaves did their best to hang on to their language, their customs, whatever they could, even though they had to hide it from their masters. All of those relate to only one thing, and that is enslaved Africans in the South. Why was it not the rest of these? Chinese immigrants who came did not come against their will. They chose to come to America, and they generally didn't work in agriculture right? As says agriculture. If you remember, the Chinese immigrants mostly worked building railroads. Uh, indentured servants in New England, they did come in many cases to work in agriculture, but again, they didn't come against their will. The point of an indentured servant was that you signed a contract, you signed up for it. Mexican farmers in the Southwest, again, was agricultural economy. Um, but they had, they came to America looking, you know, choosing to come here to, um, to try to build a, a, a better life. Okay, question five. French and Indian War. They like to ask about the French and Indian War. There's almost always a question on there. We remember the French and Indian War was about what? It was about the British colonists bumping up against the French colonists in um, uh, on the border between the British colonies and what was then called Canada. So let's just take a look at this. Okay, so this is a quick map of it. The uh, sort of beige area are British colonies. The pink are French areas. What do you notice? The line between them is what? The Appalachian Mountains. The British colonists, what did they want? This, the Ohio River Valley. Just beyond the Appalachian Mountains, you had this wonderfully fertile farmland which the British wanted to get their hands on. And, of course, the French wanted to push back against the British, and so you get the French and Indian War. The French and Indians make a, make a pact to, um, uh, to uh, an alliance against the British. The um, French, of course, had generally treated the Indians fairly well because they wanted them to be trading partners. There were not too many uh, Frenchmen in French territory, so the Indians figured, you know, they could always take the French down if they needed to. On the other hand, the English had treated the Indians very badly. There had been a bunch of massacres of the Indians. They had pushed them out of uh, English territories and all of that, and the Indians were a little afraid that the English were would, they couldn't really defeat them. So the Indians hook up with the French, the French attack the British, the British wind up winning the French and Indian War, which is how the English get not only all this beige territory, but the English wind up with all of this land. Yeah? If you remember, though, that leads to a problem. Once the English win it, they then tell the English colonists that you can't go past 
that line. The Appalachian Mountains, which we recall is called the Proclamation Line of 1763. Why? Because the English had just finished fighting this French and Indian War. The last thing they wanted was to start another war with the Indians that would be too expensive. The American colonists, English colonists in America, were pissed off about this. They had just fought this war to get that land, and now they were being told they couldn't use it. And on top of which, the British start to tax the colonists to pay for the expenses that they had built up over the war. And that's going to lead, of course, to the American Revolution. And so, of course, we get to the question, how did the outcome of the French and Indian War affect American colonists? New taxes were imposed by Britain to pay its debts. Okay, that seems like the correct answer there. But, always, always, guys, read all of the choices. British troops were removed from the colonies. Did that happen? No. British troops were left in the colonies. Settlements were allowed west of the Appalachians. As we said, absolutely not. Settlements were not allowed west of the Appalachians. That's the proclamation line. Colonial trade regulations were reduced. Nope, they did not make it easier for the colonists to trade with other countries or anything. What did happen is Britain imposed new taxes to pay for the war, and that began to tick off the Americans. Important, though, guys, always read all of the choices. Okay, six, primary purpose of the Articles of Confederation. What's the point of those? We remember the United States then fights the American Revolution. We've skipped right ahead. You notice the Regents just skips right ahead to the Revolution. The Articles of Confederation was that first document whereby the United States uh, created its first national government. So its primary purpose to provide tax revenues for the national government? No. If you remember, the Articles of Confederation, the government, couldn't tax. That was one of the reasons it failed, and we had to write a constitution. Establish the basic framework for a national government. Well, the Articles did do that. It wasn't a very well-thought-out government, wasn't very strong, but it was the basic framework. But let's see if we have any others. Give the national government the power to regulate interstate commerce. Again, no, the Articles did not give the federal government any power really at all. That was one of its problems. Establish the supremacy of the national government over the states. Well, based on what we just said, it can't be that one either. The Articles of Confederation government was too weak to work, and so we had to scrap it and start over, and that's how we get the Constitution. So the only one here that's any good is establish a basic framework for the national government. Okay, number seven. Many of the fundamental principles found in the U.S. Constitution were based on what? Okay, so that we write the Constitution, what are the ideas? Salutary neglect. Salutary neglect, remember, is neglect, but salutary means healthy. So what's the idea of that? That was when the British government left the colonies alone. That's before the French and Indian War. They just kind of neglected them, let them do, do their own thing in the hope that that would make the economy healthy, which would help the mother country. Well, U.S. Constitution has nothing to do with that. The influence of British loyalists, does that make sense? No, British loyalists were kicked out at the end of the American Revolution. They didn't have anything to do with the Constitution. Rule of absolute monarchs in Europe. Well, the principles found in the Constitution is the opposite of kings and absolute monarchs. The writings of enlightenment philosophers. Ah, ha, ha. Yes. And in particular, the writings of John 
lock. Know it. If he comes up. John Locke. He is the guy who provides most of the philosophical ideas behind the U.S. Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. They like to ask about him. Okay. Let's see if we can make that disappear. All right. Federalism. Separation of powers and checks and balances are constitutional principles that directly do what? Okay, so let's remember what these are. Okay, so federalism. Federalism is the idea of shared power between the states and the national government. We are both one country with a real national government with real power, and 50 individual states, and each state has its own power and authority. That balance between the power of states and the power of the national government keeps either one from becoming too powerful. Separation of powers is the idea that you've got three branches of government, each with its own independent powers. The legislative branch, which is the Congress, makes the law. The executive branch, which is the president, carries out the law. And the judicial branch, which is the courts, interpret the law, decide how to apply the law in a particular circumstance, tells you what the words of the law mean. The idea of checks and balances because you have the separation of powers and three separate branches, each of the three branches can block the other two to prevent any one branch from becoming too powerful. So the legislative branch makes the law, and the president is stuck with that, and the legislative branch, the Senate, um, get, well, uh, let me say, first, the Congress makes the law. The president is stuck with the law, and so are the courts. The courts have to interpret the law that's written. They can't make it up. Um, the Senate in the legislature, in the Congress, also gets to approve judges to the federal courts. The executive branch, the president, has the authority to veto a law from Congress, Congress can override that veto if they get a two-thirds vote to override. Uh, and the president is the guy who gets to appoint the members of the judicial branch. He gets to appoint the judges, which have to be approved by Congress. And then finally, the judicial branch has the power of, remember it, judicial review, which says that um, the courts are the ones who finally determine whether a law is constitutional or not, and then how to apply it. So, checks and balances, these are the three branches pushing against each other to make sure no one branch gets too powerful. Okay, so... Federalism, separation of powers, and checks and balances are constitutional principles that directly do what? Empower more voters? Well, not really. They don't have a direct effect on voting power. Restrict individual liberties? Again, the, the, these ideas don't really have anything to do with your individual right to free speech or freedom of religion. Involve citizens in the governing process. Once more, that we have citizens in the governing process, but these three things aren't really about that. Reduce the concentration of governmental power. Yep. Uh, you split power between the states and the feds. You split power between the three branches. And with checks and balances, you um, 
have the three branches pushing against each other. Okay, let's move on. Okay, uh, question nine here. James Wilson at the Constitutional Convention, that's when they were writing the Constitution, says, we should consider that we are providing a Constitution for future generations and not merely for the peculiar circumstances of the moment. Okay. Hmm. The writers of the Constitution best applied this idea by providing for what? An electoral college to select the president. Does that have to do with providing for future generations? Well, not really. Let's see what else we have. Due process of law to protect individual civil rights. Well, that protects individuals, that's true, but is that really about focus on future generations? Hmm. Direct election of members of Congress. Well, the Constitution had direct election of members of the House of Representatives, but originally the Senate was chosen by state government. A method for adopting constitutional amendments. Aha. That works. The framers put the method of, of writing amendments to the Constitution in so that you could change the Constitution in future generations to make it flexible. So if you, when the, when the world changed, when the country changed, you could adjust the Constitution to make it work. So number three has got to be the correct answer. The United States Constitution provides that federal judges be appointed for life, which it does. You're appointed a federal judge. You can't be fired uh, unless you engage in misconduct, in which case you can be impeached. But you can't simply be fired. Okay. And you're not elected. You don't have to run for re-election. Well, why did do they do that? They provided that. Federal judges be appointed for life primarily to do what? Protect the judicial decision-making from the influence of political pressure. Does that sound right? It does, right? The point of a judge being appointed for life is so that he doesn't have to worry about pleasing the crowd to run for re-election or about pleasing his boss because he's going to get fired, so he can do what he honestly believes is the correct and right and just thing to do under the law. Let's make sure. Check the other choices. Provide time for a more thorough investigation of cases. Well, you don't really need a lifetime appointment for a judge to investigate a case. Ensure that judicial decisions are based on precedent. Judges are supposed to follow the pattern that has been set by previous decisions. That really doesn't have to have anything to do with how long any one justice sits on the courts. Uh, guarantee that different viewpoints are represented in the Supreme Court. It really doesn't have anything to do with that at all. Okay. Number 11. Oops. Point. A Bill of Rights should be added. The central government is too powerful. The nation is too large to remain a republic. Well, what are those three things? What are they about? These statements express concerns of citizens who opposed what? Colonial rule of, rule of Great Britain? Well, no, the central government is too powerful. Yeah, but republic, it's not a republic under Great Britain. It's a kingdom. Bill of Rights, no. Principles expressed in the Albany Plan of Union. If you remember what the Albany Plan of Union was, it was that attempt during the French and Indian War to create a kind of uh, council of the American colonies to help conduct the war, but th that really doesn't have anything to do with bills of rights. Nobody complained about that. 
secession of southern states from the Union. Well, the southern states were not looking for a Bill of Rights. They were looking to take rights away from people. Ratification of the Constitution. Aha! When the Constitution was proposed, there were a lot of people who said, there's no Bill of Rights in it. And so Alexander Hamilton, if you remember, had to promise that he would add one after it was passed. The central government is too powerful. There were people who said the Constitution made the central government too powerful. We had just fought a revolution. We didn't want a government that was too powerful. The nation is too large to remain a republic. There were people who said that the Constitution, uh, maybe we should split up into individual states. So that's the only one that fits. Okay, number 12. Controversy over the establishment of the Bank of the United States and the imposition of a federal excise tax was most closely associated with what? Okay, so this is the early days of the United States government. There's a proposal to create a Bank of the United States to help control the economy, and a federal excise tax. An excise tax is just a fancy word for a kind of sales tax. And if you remember, the government ran originally on a whiskey tax. Okay, so who talked about a Bank of the United States to help stabilize the economy and a federal whiskey tax to pay for the government. Did Thomas Jefferson talk about this, supporting Lewis and Clark? No, Lewis and Clark expedition was to find out what was in the Louisiana Purchase we just bought, um, and Jefferson did not want a national bank. He thought a national bank made the government too powerful. John Adams signing the Alien and Sedition Acts into law. John Adams was worried about uh, French influence in America, and the Alien and Sedition Acts uh, basically was targeted at French immigrants uh, who he thought were trying to drag the U.S. into the war between Britain and France. There's nothing to do with any of this. George Washington issuing his Proclamation of Neutrality. Washington, remember, wanted to keep the U.S. out of European affairs, particularly out of the war between France and Britain. This has nothing to do with it. Alexander Hamilton introducing his financial plan. There you go. Remember, when you think of Hamilton, you should think of trying to, uh, a guy who wanted to promote a strong national government and a stable economy because he wanted to promote big business. How come? Not because he was a greedy guy, but because he believed that the future power of America was going to be its economic power. That if the new United States, the baby country United States, was going to last and be able to defend itself, the only way it could was if its economy was very strong and therefore we had to build up business. So his financial plan included the Bank of the United States, a whiskey tax, a tariff. We remember the tariff. The tariff is tax on imports. It would make the cost of imported goods higher, so Americans would buy American-made stuff instead. That was what he was about. Okay. Let's look at 13 now. Whoop. Base your answer to question 13 on this passage and blah, blah, blah. Okay, so let's look at a quote. We need, we see the where it comes from. Hinton Helper, well, you might not know him. The Impending Crisis of the South, 1857. Well, that should give you an idea. 1857 is before the Civil War, just before the Civil War. And the crisis of the South probably has something to do with slavery. 
Okay, so let's look at this. And now to the point, in our opinion, an opinion which has been formed from the data obtained by thorough researches and comparisons, from laborious investigation, logical reasoning, and earnest reflection, the causes which have impeded the progress and prosperity of the South, which have dwindled our commerce and other pursuits into the most contemptible insignificance, sunk a large majority of our people in galling poverty and ignorance, rendered a small minority conceited and tyrannical, and driven the rest away from their homes, entailed upon us a humiliating dependence on the free states, disgrace us in the recesses of our souls, and brought us under the reproach of the eyes of all civilians and enlightened nations, may be traced to one common source, and there find solution in the most hateful and horrible word that was ever incorporated into human vocabulary, uh, human economy, slavery. Okay. So if you read it, think about it a minute, what is this guy saying? He's saying the South has all kinds of problems. We've got poverty, we've got ignorance, we've got a small minority of people who are tyrannical, who kind of run the, the whole show down here. We've got disgrace in our souls. We've been brought under the reproach that is the, the uh, disapproval of enlightened nations so we're really screwed up here in the South. And what is the one thing that has screwed us up? Slavery. So this guy is writing about how terrible slavery is for Southerners, how it's actually screwed up the South. Question? The statement most clearly expresses the author's opinion that slavery should be extended to the Western territories. Well, no that slavery caused the North to be dependent on the South? No. That slavery was the reason the South should secede from the Union? He's not arguing that the South should be a separate country. That slavery was the cause of economic and social problems of the South? There we go. That's the one that makes sense. Okay. Let's look at 14. The Passage of the Homestead Act. 1862. What was the Homestead Act? It gave farmers a plot of land as long as they were willing to settle on it, farm it, and stay there for uh, a certain number of years. So it encouraged people to move west. And the completion of the first transcontinental railroad. Transcontinental railroad connected the east, Chicago, New York, the east coast, to San Francisco in the west, and therefore a railroad that went right across the middle of the country, encouraged settlement of what region? And the answer is, is it the Gulf Coast? The Gulf Coast is down in the south. No. Ohio River Valley? No, that had long been settled by that time. Atlantic Coastal Plain? That was settled back in the English colonies. The Great Plains. That's Kansas, Nebraska, North and South Dakota, all that area between the Mississippi and the Rocky Mountains that was the west of its day. All right. So I want to keep each of these to about 40 minutes. So we will uh, stop there, and the next video will pick up with question 15.